All right, folks, we're going to get started. Um, first of all, thank you all for braving the weather. Yeah, I envisioned this to be a much more warmer um, occasion. But um, My name is Ben Olivo. I'm co-founder and editor of the San Antonio Heron. Um, we launched um, in June of 2018 um, as a nonprofit uh, news organization in, in San Antonio. And um, so we're, we're fast approaching our two-year um, anniversary in June. We uh, primarily write about downtown uh, housing. It's sort of our, the thing that we've tried to concentrate on, um, as well as uh, the neighborhoods around downtown, because as, as we all know, um, neighborhoods are changing. And so um, that's, that's sort of our, what we do. Um, I did want to thank, real quick, the uh, Charity Bar. Um, we are one of three uh, nonprofits featured here in the month of uh, February. And if you don't know how it works, if you buy a drink, they give you a token, and then you can use that token to uh, vote for us, like in the little voting area, in the, it, you know, off to the side, inside the, uh, the building here. Um, I also want to thank uh, San Japan, um, the anime convention. You may be wondering why. Um, they provided this uh, the sound system for us, so thank you very much for that. Um, and then I also wanted to um, I also wanted to say that um, I am super thrilled to have these panels here uh, talking about housing. Um, these uh, four um, folks represent. I mean, they are decision makers when it comes to um, downtown policy, housing policy, um, and, and just housing decisions in general. And, but I also wanted to make sure that y'all knew that I, I do realize that there are other voices that need to be heard in, in this type of the setting when it comes to housing. And so my hope is that this is the first of you know, two, three um, panels like this that we do this year. Um, I could definitely see us um, hosting something on, on the Renters Commission, which is uh, a really hot topic right now that the, um, that the council will consider. Um, and also uh, evictions. I mean, that's something that has sort of come to light of late um, that I think uh, needs, deserves um, a, a town hall setting like this. Um, but again, in order for us to do more events like this, we need support. And so I just wanted to make sure that that's clear. <laughs> um, so before I introduce the, um, the panelists, um, I wanted to kind of frame our conversation because um, 2020 is going to be a really important year when it comes to, to housing, housing policy in San Antonio. Um, for one, the uh, downtown incentive policy uh, that the city has expires in uh, December. And so the city, um, if they haven't already, will uh, begin to assess that program. And at some point, um, I, I, su I suspect in the middle of the year, toward the end of the year, they will present um, a recommendation to the council, and the council will have to decide, um, you know, do we keep the program? Do we adjust it? Do we give more subsidy to the developer? Do we give them less subsidy? And so that conversation is going to be happening uh, this year. Um, also, the city is, I believe, uh, the city started uh, interviews for the uh, housing administrator, if I'm not correct. Okay. And so and that is uh, one of the recommendations that came from the uh, mayor's housing policy task force. And so, and also the other, rec uh, the main recommendation that came from the mayor's housing policy task force was a coordinated housing system, which is uh, the concept is let's take all of these housing commissions, boards, um, all these incentive programs, um, all these entities that are outside the city, like the San Antonio Housing Authority, and let's, um, the city, let's corral them and um, sort of align them so that we can be more efficient about the way we approach housing, and especially housing affordability. Um, so I think this is a great uh, sort of start to the year as those conversations uh, will be had later. So let's do introductions. Um, well, the seating arrangements are a little off, but I'll, I'll wait. <laughs> right next to me is uh, Randy Smith. He is president of Weston Urban. Uh, Weston Urban co-built the Frost Tower. 
and they're getting ready to build um, a lot of housing units in West Downtown. Um, this is also the area of downtown where UTSA is expanding. So um, this area, you're going to see it change uh, pretty rapidly pretty soon um, when you consider what they're doing in UTSA. Uh, next to Randy is Sofia Lopez. Uh, Sofia is a housing researcher at Action Center on Race and the Economy. And she also serves on the San Antonio Housing Authority Board of Commissioners. Thank you. Um, mayor Nuremberg, we know the mayor. Um, and uh, soon after being elected mayor in 2017, he created the, the Mayor's Housing Policy Task Force, a five-member group that led dozens of public discussions and town hall meetings about housing affordability. And in August 2018, the task force released its report that laid out a framework for how San Antonio should tackle its housing issues. And then uh, finally, uh, Lori Houston. Lori Houston is assist assistant city manager who oversees the Center City Development um, and Operations Department, which oversees the city's incentive policy. And she also oversees um, the Neighborhood and Housing Services Department, which um, oversees a, a, a plethora of programs that are sort of designed to keep people in their homes and as well as uh, help people uh, with eviction debt and stuff like that. So the first question, I wanted to start us off, I want to ask the panelists, what is your vision for the central part of San Antonio? Yes, downtown, but also the neighborhoods, because they, they're all sort of joined together. Um, what happens downtown impacts the neighborhoods. And um, to y'all, what? Where do you, what's sort of your, your perfect sort of, the, the way downtown evolves from here in the next 5, 10, or, or 15 years? And Mayor, if you want to kind of start us off on that. Sure, and thank you, uh, Ben and Heron, uh, for having us today, uh, panelists, as well as everyone who's attended, attending today. I, I think this is a very diverse uh, audience. I, I can tell by folks I've visited with a multitude of perspectives on housing, so this will be a very interesting discussion. You know, my view on, on downtown is really derived from how we talked about downtown in SA 2020, which 10 years ago kind of laid out the community's vision for how we wanted to see San Antonio develop over the next 10 years up to the year we're living in right now. And, and primarily it is a recognition that downtown is a vibrant place uh, where people can live and work uh, that is once again kind of the heartbeat of San Antonio. And as we've seen that uh, kind of develop over the last 10 years through incentive policies that have really started to see development uh, pick up and the cranes in the air and the new jobs coming in and the uh, lots of new development, uh, housing development, which, which now is over 7,000 units, we've started to tweak or, or perhaps add more description to that vision. And one of them is that downtown needs to play a place where everyone can thrive, that it's uh, a place where it doesn't it doesn't require to be require you to be of a certain income bracket. This is a place where we can all find a, a place, and it belongs to everyone. So, uh, my vision for downtown is that it is a vibrant urban center, uh, an economic uh, development center where we have live, work, play opportunities, and lots of employment and recreation uh, for locals. Uh, but also, it's a place where a lot of mixed development of all different types, uh, single family, single family. Uh, development, but also um, you know, multifamily development of multiple um, AMI levels. Uh, I think that's the kind of um, downtown we're beginning to see more of. Obviously, uh, it's very difficult because downtown is some of the most expensive dirt in the city. Um, and that's why it's been very difficult for us to balance these different programs that help ultimately have kick-started uh, the growth and the, the vibrancy of downtown. Lori, you want to go, and we'll just kind of come back. <laughs> Can you all hear me? Okay. So I'm going to add a little bit to that. I mean, it's very similar to the mayor's vision, but I, I lived downtown for a couple of years. I lived in the Vistana, and I had a child that learned to walk in the Vistana. And my vision for downtown, when I think about that, is it would have been hopefully in five years I can... I could live in the Vistana, I could have walked out that door with my child in the stroller, been able to walk and do some shopping, been able to pick up dry cleaning. Um, if I were to 
I had a place to drop my kid off for daycare, like a place you could live in. And so, and we're getting there. The more residents we add, the more neighborhood services we'll be able to provide. But when I think about my vision, I would love to be able to just walk to work, be able to do my grocery shopping, not get in my car, be able to take my child to daycare or to school and go home. And it, it was a little challenging um, when, when I had her, and this was about four years ago. Um, it's gotten better, but we have some more work to do. Gotcha. Okay. Great. Um, so I appreciate everyone being here tonight. I'm really excited to be here. Um, I think I approached this from a different place. Um, so you mentioned the place that I work, actually. I'm just going to say two things about that. So uh, I'm, I'd be happy to tell folks a little bit more about it, but essentially I researched the financialization of housing, and so housing gets traded from investor to investor to investor, and the ways in which that makes it more and more difficult for ordinary folks to have a place to live. I think that that really informs the lens that I approach this conversation from. Um, and then I think also just serving on the housing authority, I think the thing that, that sits in my head, I also wanted to make a comment about that, right? I'm one of seven board members. I don't speak for the housing authority. I have my own opinions. just want to be very clear about that. Um, but, it, you know, the number that just sticks in my head from our meeting agendas is the fact that at most of our public housing properties, the average income is $10,000 a year. And I think any one of us would struggle to get by on just $10,000 a year. I don't know what folks in this room make, right? But it's just an assumption of mine. And I'm very worried. So just one, one other thing before I get to my actual vision. Um, you know, I, I think with me also in this conversation, I just want to reflect folks that I have talked to and heard from through meetings um, at Housing Authority Properties. And I just remember this one woman particularly saying uh, every meeting that she goes to is food that's not in her refrigerator. and so. I deeply appreciate everyone who has made the time to come here tonight, and I just also am holding myself, the people who cannot be here in my mind. Um, so my vision for downtown is one in which I actually I drove around downtown last night just preparing and reflecting on this. It's definitely one where nobody has to wrap themselves in a blanket and sit in the alcove of a doorway to shield themselves from the cold. Those people actually have a place to live, and it is a beautiful place to live. It's a place with dignity. It's not sleeping in an open courtyard. Um, and then also, I think um, people who work downtown, like I, I'm used to seeing folks making transfers, trying to catch the VIA lineup late at night. Um, those folks don't have to take multiple buses to get to where they live. They don't have to wait 45 minutes or more just to see their families at the end of their shift. It is the place where many different people live, are able to live and work um, and don't have to commute uh, long distances. And then I would also just say from, from that vantage point, you just mentioning the, the financialization of housing that I spent time uh, looking into, I think it takes a lot more public investment in housing. Um, if we're talking about the dream world that we want to see, yes. it's... It, <laughs> I could get very into the weeds, but I'll just say it's not legal to build more public housing right now, but I think that that's 100% what we need to solve our crisis. So there's a lot of quality, beautiful public housing in our downtown, and people are able to live in it, they're able to raise their families in it, they're able to walk to work. That is my vision. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I mean, I, I would start my... my, my my vision for a five to ten year downtown with a couple of caveats. The first would be that I think my fellow panelists have probably forgotten more about housing than I know. Uh, as Ben said, we are about to do a bunch of things downtown as it relates to housing. Thus far, the first eight years of our company's existence have been primarily uh, uh, providing office space downtown. So I would say that um, everything I'm about to tell you is aspirational. Uh, and then, and then. Uh, secondly, we all struggle to define downtown differently. So when I'm talking about downtown, I'm talking about a pretty tight circle around the, the, the central business district. Uh, and I think, uh, I think Ben, our, my sort of vision or dream for that over a five to ten year window is rooted in two words. Uh, I think density and diversity. So density, I think, is fairly self-explanatory. 
Uh, I joke sometimes that we are in the surface parking lot eradication business, uh, and we aspire to do that. Um, but density, I think, is the, uh, the equally weighted one. And I don't mean it in, in the maybe easy way to think about it, that maybe you know everybody downtown looks different. I think that's just kind of table stakes, and I don't think we need to talk about that anymore. Uh, one of the things I think about on diversity is really schedules. Like, Lori and I left downtown at 7 o'clock. We walked two full blocks and didn't pass another human being. In the, on basically from Martin to Houston Street. And so uh, I think if, if in five to ten years we can achieve a significantly greater level of density and a significantly greater level of diversity across, uh, across all demographics, uh, calendars, uh, employment levels, types of employment, housing types, that's sort of what we think about as the dream state. Gotcha. Um, you mentioned density. I, we've written uh, recently about um, the city council had a debate recently about the city's uh, incentive policy for downtown uh, housing. Uh, that policy, it's, it's known as the center city housing incentive policy. Um, short version of that is CCHIP. So whenever you hear CCHIP, we're talking about this, the city's downtown policy. And the city, the way it works is um, uh, developers get a tax rebate on the city portion of their property taxes. Um, it's a 75% of the city portion. So they still pay the other property, um, they still pay to the county and to the school district. Um, and the, the other 25% goes into an affordable housing fund. And th these are some of the changes that happened um, uh, a couple of years ago, uh, or actually a year ago. Um, and my, my question, and I'll, I'll shoot this back to you, Mayor, because I, I know that I, I've talked to some developers, uh, not, not you, Randy, but um, other developers who say that because developers are getting less of an incentive, that that is, they're, they're, they believe that that's going to make, make it harder for them to build housing downtown. And um, some folks have, have said that um, um, the city kind of wants it both ways. Like we want density, but we want, we want affordability, and we can't do both at the same time. That's their point of view. Um, I also know that there's a developer out of Austin, um, Sabat Development, who's building something across uh, from the Pearl, and they're building it, and they've indicated that they don't need the incentive. So. I guess my question to you, Mayor, and for everyone else, is um, can you achieve density and affordability at the same time? And, and when I say affordability, I, I'm, I'm ta I realize that you know, developers still need to make a profit of some kind. Um, but can you, have, can you have them both at the same time? I guess that's my question. Um, well, it's a great question. It's one that we're struggling with right now, and I think that you're seeing that play out in the different versions of the seed chip that come out, uh, I would say that we have to try uh, and we have to make that happen because, uh, number one, we know that the public's appetite for using resources for projects that the public simply can't afford to live in uh, is not very high. And so as we've seen sort of this decade of downtown unfold and we get closer to the goal of the number of units to be built, the more and more of those units that are built uh, that, you know, far exceed the rent or mortgage payment that anyone, you know, average San Antonio can actually afford, uh, the less they're going to support us being able to use these programs. I say that in full recognition that the C-CHIP was created as an economic development incentive, not as a housing incentive, in order to kickstart a market that really was dormant. It's done its job, and so we came back, um, uh, I guess three years ago now, a um, little less, to basically put a, put a stop, pump the brakes on C-CHIP and say we need to reevaluate this because if all we're doing is using public resources to churn out product that is only available to the highest incomes in San Antonio, then we're not doing justice to the intent of the public vision in SA 2020. Um, so we came back, we, we included some uh, affordability criteria in it. Uh, it was slow to start. We've seen some pro we've seen some projects now utilize it. Those project 
Those projects are also controversial, but we're starting to see some affordable units be part of the CHIP project. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, you know, we're going to continue to try, try to tweak this, but I think that, for, number one, density is absolutely required if we're going to build a sustainable city. Uh, density is required for us to build things like a, a, a meaningful public transit system, to build walkable communities, uh, et cetera, build quality of life, frankly. Uh, but we also have to make sure that if we are required as a public to use our own resources to create that market, we've got to include affordability or the public won't stand for it. Gotcha. Sophia, do you want to? Thank you. Um, yeah, I completely agree. So I absolutely think that your question was like, are density and affordability compatible? Sure, absolutely. Um, but what I'm less interested in is seeing strictly luxury density or density for its own sake that doesn't take into consideration the fact of who lives in this city, right? Um, I agree that density is a critical component of building a more sustainable city. I think getting people out of their cars, but what is not part of a sustainable city is a downtown that is full of lots of tall, beautiful, very expensive buildings that the people who live in this community cannot afford. That leads to a dynamic that is happening all across the country, suburbanization of poverty. And so yeah, I, I completely agree with critics of some of the policies that we have that have not actually achieved meaningful affordability. And I think I, for one, um, cringe when I, when I think about the sort of trickle-down approach. I mean, I personally get very frustrated when I see the number of units that have been constructed for people earning 30% of the area median income. And then I think also on top of that, wondering how much people end up paying, what proportion of their income people end up paying just to afford rent. I meant to look up the number before I came, right? But just the fact that there are so many people in this community who spend more than this 30%, which in my mind is actually in many ways arbitrary, but then up to 50% of their income per month on rent. If you're a family of four, if you're a single mother, and you have to put food on the table, I, I could go on and on and on. This, this stuff just enrages me because I think of my family members who live in this community. Again, I think of those people who earn, I think of those people who are sitting on soft waiting lists, for example, which is years long. What, what, what do people do in the meantime? So I, I understand that there have been uses of our public resources to try and drive this density question. And I understand that it's complicated and difficult. Um, but I, that is sort of the North Star vision that I want to keep in mind and that I think lots of people in our community do too. Randy, do you want to tackle this one? Sure. Uh, I think that density and affordability are, are absolutely compatible. I mean, I, those are not two mutually exclusive things. Um, and, and I also think um, that it's, it's worth discussing that, that this is just a complex issue. I don't think there's anybody in here that can rattle off the name of a city in America that's doing this really well. Uh, I think communities uh, everywhere are struggling with this, and I'm encouraged that we have, you know, groups like this that will come together to, to, to put our best foot forward. Um, and, and I also think that if you came here tonight with this notion that the city is giving the farm away to real estate developers, I would like to immediately remove that uh, from, you know, your thought. If that's just not the case. Even under what, what we would call old seed ship, uh, that was not the case. Especially as it relates to other cities, especially as it relates to other cities in Texas. And Texas poses its own really unique set of challenges for people in the for-profit uh, real estate development business. So I, I read your article from yesterday. You know, I think Mr. Schoen is correct in that most folks in my line of work would really strive for a six to eight percent return on a project. So I, I don't know where many of you work. Uh, I don't know if that's your employer or your company's business model, six to eight percent, but I'll tell you, I came from a tech company, and man, we there is no nobody was gonna was gonna really get out of bed for a six to eight percent return. I will just suggest to you that in the overall picture, that is a very lean business model, 
And I'll tell you that in Texas, it's even harder. Uh, you know, when we're talking about percentage points that close, the property tax regime in Texas is, by depending on who's counting, who is second highest or third highest in America. You have New Jersey, and then we are currently duking it out with New Hampshire, and then you have everybody else. And so, I, I, I bring that up just to highlight Sophia's point that this this whatever a solution is to our affordable housing crisis, and I I currently believe that that is uh, a mis that, it, that is mistitled. There's a better title for our crisis, uh, but whatever it is is going to require everyone on this stage. It certainly will not be solved by the for-profit development community. I want to ask you about your last comment, but I want to see, uh, Lori, if you want to. I, I want to add that it's about balance, and I, I like to say we have a housing crisis. We don't have an affordable housing crisis. We need housing, and we need market rate housing downtown, too, because if we do not have market rate housing in our downtown area, someone's going to purchase housing and make it market rate, and that could mean taking supply away from the affordable housing opportunities that we have downtown or within those neighborhoods to meet that demand. So it's about balance and looking to make sure that we are providing opportunities for market rate housing to develop and affordable housing. I also want to mention, you know, Sophia talked about, you know, having buildings in downtown where people can't live, and I don't want that either. We don't have a lot of density in downtown San Antonio yet either. And there's a reason for that, and it's really expensive to build in that little circle downtown. It's not, it, it's expensive to build in the areas around that circle as well, but it's very expensive to build downtown. And so we're not going to see a 20 or 30 story building in downtown San Antonio without some subsidy or without it being ultra luxury. And I want to add that thanks to the changes that the council made in the last CHIP, we can't incent that. We won't incent that. And we do have a cap on it. But, so we have some protections in place to make sure that public dollars are not being used to support that type of luxury. But it's expensive. And if it wasn't, we'd see more density in the downtown. Gotcha. I was going to say this question for last, but you, you brought it up, Randy. <laughs> um, I, I remember uh, there was a, 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 a similar housing panel. It was like a downtown development panel that happened um, at startup week. Um, a few months ago, and it was all the, the all the downtown developers, yourself, uh, Bill Schoen, David Adelman, um, and, and a, few, a few others. And I remember there were some comments made at that panel, um, and I, I, I don't remember if you said this, but you just pretty much said it, <laughs> is that you, they didn't believe that there was an affordability um, crisis in San Antonio. And, you know, I... When I interviewed you, Mayor, for this last piece that we wrote, um, you talked about the importance of not just bringing down the cost of uh, rents in, in the form of affordable housing down to lower income folks, but you talked about the importance of bringing them up to the rent as well, right? In the form of educational attainment, workforce development, and stuff like that. So I guess I um, wanted to see if Maybe I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit. And Mir, if you want to start us off, and then we'll, we'll get back to Randy. Well, sure. I mean, we're, we're ultimately talking about the issue of poverty in San Antonio leading in that department, and it's a lot of different things. Um, the, the most critical thing, of course, is the cost of shelter, cost of housing. Um, but that's not the only thing. It's also a function of, you know, wages in the city. But there's a lot of things within a city's, uh, within a family's, um, livelihood that are counted, cost of utilities, um, cost of health care, cost of food, and certainly cost of transportation. So when it comes to an affordability crisis, you know, the cost of your rent payment is combined with all of these things, and if those things exceed the amount of wages that a family is earning, you're going to find them on the bubble, and then ultimately you're going to see what we're seeing today which is that the only category of homelessness that's rising in San Antonio is homeless families. And so we do have a crisis, and that means that if we're doing our jobs right, we're attacking it from multiple different angles. We cannot lose the sight of the fact that we need deeper affordability in different AMIs, 30, 30 to 50 percent, 60 percent, 80 percent. 
and then up to 120% according to our, our Housing Policy Task Force report. We're doing all of that. It's really, really difficult, especially in the urban core, to get the deeper affordability of the 30 to 50%, but you're starting to see those projects tied to anything that we use public resources with. But I will say the most critical thing for us to do as a city is to really work on this issue of economic mobility, which is why you've seen the city, um, again, uh, we're going to be asking voters to approve our pre-K initiative. We've been working with our K through 12 system to provide for, uh, you know, innovation and, and, and um, you know, the work that Pedro is doing and, and other school districts are doing to tie, to tie employee, employment opportunities to the actual um, K through 12 and high school uh, age uh, classes. And then ultimately a program like Alamo Promise, which will ensure that every Bear County High School graduate is able to attend an Alamo Community College District without tuition. All of those things are incredibly important. And then of course we can go into healthcare and what limited role the city can play in that. But I don't discount the importance of us attacking each and every one of these things. And, and what we can do with the resources that we're providing is ensure that when, any, any time we're using public resources that we're ensuring that the development is creative enough to create that affordability at the different AMI levels. Gotcha. Uh, Laura, do you want to? I want to add that the importance of the regional centers, the SA Tomorrow Plan. I mean, one of the beauties about that is we identified 13 centers where we have these employment centers, and we need to make sure that we're building affordable housing and housing opportunities around that, because those are the centers that have the transportation opportunities. Those are the centers that, that can support housing and support workforce. Um, and it just speaks to the importance of strategic planning and making sure that all of our partners at the table. Gotcha. Y'all may need to re remove the mics and then kind of share it. Okay, we will. Yeah. But, but since yeah. I have to remove it, I blew it. Okay. <laughs> I forgot to give you a pitch on why we're actually pursuing public transportation. Oh, right. I mean, right. The, the whole reason, one of the most important reasons why we're, we're pursuing viable, bona fide public transportation in the system is that there is no greater disruptor to poverty in our city than to make sure that we have a public transportation system that works, mm -hmm. which is why we're pursuing it, and, and I hope we approve it. But again, the point being, and I don't mean to you know take the mic away from Lori, is that we have to attack the issue of affordability from all avenues, wages, more uh, rent payments, uh, the number of available units that are affordable, and also things like, importantly, transportation. Gotcha. Okay. Were you done, Lori? Or yeah. I'll just repeat what I said about the SA Tomorrow planning efforts and making sure that we're being very strategic and having a conversation about affordability and affordable housing in each of those 13 centers. And 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 one thing I didn't mention is that the uh, the CTRIP, the incentive policy, does extend to the 13 regional centers. Yes, right? okay. and, yeah. and we talk about affordability and we talk about housing. It doesn't help building an affordable housing um, opportunity outside of those regional centers because these are the centers that have the transit opportunities. These are the centers that have the workforce. So it just speaks to the importance of making sure that we are all talking together, we have that coordinated housing system, and we have a strategy that we've all adopted. Gotcha. Okay. Sophia, is there an affordability crisis? Absolutely. I mean, I, I mentioned people sleeping wrapped up in blankets in our downtown. What more evidence do you need that there's an affordability crisis? Um, there are so many things. Um, so I love that you bring up transportation, actually. I, I spent some time reflecting a while back about how, you're right, tra I mean, transit's a public good. It is something that should be funded because people rely on it. I feel similarly about housing, right? I also, I just, I think it's so critical to, to lift up the fact that I mean, I think it was actually, I can't, maybe Jean Dawson in part of the uh, Mayor's Housing Policy Task Force that talked about housing as a utility, something that everybody should absolutely have access to. That's such an important idea that needs to be lifted up. It is a human right. It is a necessity. You can't do anything without a home. Um, so, so yes, a thousand percent, it is a crisis. I, you know, there are actually vacant properties on my block um, and they've been vacant for about two years now, and there are people who squat there, and I wrestle somewhat because I know my neighbors, I've talked to my neighbors, 
and some of them are very afraid of the potential crime that that brings. But I also think that there is a terrible reality that makes someone resort to finding a vacant home as a place to have a simple roof over their head. But it shouldn't have to be the case. And I think in a city where we do have homelessness, we shouldn't have vacant properties. We need to find something to do about that. There should be people living in those homes right now and all of the other vacant homes all across the city. Right. Sure. Yeah, I think, I think my point was, I think we're labeling it wrong. And that's, look, just my opinion. It's worth exactly what you paid for it. Um, that's what we asked you to be. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I think we have an opportunity crisis. And I, I'm, I'm, I am prone to oversimplifying things. The mayor listed some other good ones that clearly need to be mentioned. But, I, you know, I think about uh, this crisis, really. I don't think you can talk about affordable housing without talking about wages and transportation. And despite the mayor's hard work, I, I still don't know that we're there yet as a community on an actionable mass transit plan and if we are I don't think that we're there yet on how we're going to pay for it and so I think that's going to take a village um, and then um, on the opportunity front I completely agree this is an issue about poverty and I think until as a business community and uh, you know we are doing our best to take a leadership role in this but until the business community sees uh, poverty and things like uh, pre-k and things like pre-pre-K, until we start looking at matters like childcare and mental health and affordable housing and pre-K as, as you know, economic development matters, then we're not going to get there. Can I respond to that? You can, but Mayor, do you want to respond to Randy's comment about the transportation? <laughs> <laughs> if you want. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Randy and I will talk after about the funding. It, it will, we have a funding plan. Um, and, and I would say, not to get into the weeds, this is a housing discussion, but it, it, does, it does merit a response to transportation. One of the challenges for the city, as you've seen you know, cities like Houston and Austin go out and propose billions of dollars of improvements in, in transit, we could do that too. If we also did what they are going to do, which is propose property tax increases to fund it. If we did that here in this city with 20 plus percent poverty, we would be hurting the most disadvantaged members of the community that are depending on us delivering that transit system. The most important work that this city will ever do on building a bona fide mass transit system and public transportation system is being done right now which is it placing the foundation stone, actually building the first mass transit lines, but more important than that, increasing the frequency and actually bringing to life a actual major city urban bus system. Most important thing, frequency and reliability on your bus system to make sure that working families can get to and from home, work, school, uh, in a reliable manner, affordably, and everything else builds from that. Once you start raising the level of uh, standard of living in the city on, on aggregate, once you see the level of wealth as an as a overall um, system, we, we can actually begin to make deeper investments without burdening um, taxpayers. But this is what we're doing right now in order to fund a system that works for our city for working families in a way that doesn't also burden the most disadvantaged members of the community. Gotcha. Sophia, did you want to? No, I want to respond to that too. <laughs> um, but aren't we proposing a sales tax to fund it? One that already exists. But sales taxes are regressive, and I think we all know that. The people who pay them, if we're talking about not making poor people pay the most for these services, and you're saying that that's why you wouldn't want to increase property taxes. Sales taxes are yeah. actually doing just that. Right, and which makes Texas one of the most regressive forms, uh, most regressive states in terms of taxation in the nation. Um, it's a problem for our state. Um, 
However, the sales tax level in the city of San Antonio is what it is. It's not going to change. It's not going to go down. It's going to remain the same. And what we're suggesting we need to do is reprioritize some of that sales tax to go towards actual benefit that's critical, public transportation. Meanwhile, the other programs that are being funded can be done in a much more long-term manner with existing funding without burdening uh, taxpayers. Without raising taxes, without raising fees, without raising rates. We need to figure out how to fund a mass transit system, a public transportation system, without doing that, and that's what this plan will do. Well, no disagreement on needing to fund a mass transit system, for sure. Um, okay, that was the segue. Um, oh goodness, okay, what was it that I even wanted to respond to? I think you, you made it, yes, you made a comment saying that the business community was taking leadership on finding solutions. I believe it was with respect to housing, and I think the thing that you said what, on a variety of issues, actually. Do you want to clarify yeah, before yeah. I continue? I think what I'm saying is, is until the business community realizes that all these issues are economic development issues, that is, impact their businesses in a really real way, we're not going to get there. We as a city are not going to get there? That's correct. We as a community. That's just such a bleak picture for the future of the city. And I refuse to accept it. I honestly do. Because I am someone who 1,000% believes that housing is a human right, and we need to find some kind of alternative that doesn't strictly rely on the business community realizing it's an issue. I'm someone, just let me finish, I'm someone who deeply believes in the power of community organizing. That's why I do the work that I do. And I think that it takes community members actually banding together Clarifying what solutions actually work for them, bringing those to the city, and making sure that we are actually prioritizing things that people need, like I said, as a human right, for their own survival. Amen, right? I, mean, I, 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 don't, I don't mean to say that the business community is sufficient. I mean to say that they're necessary. They are part of that community you're talking about. They're a big part of it. And until they get behind and see that these are issues that matter, I'm just saying... If you have a significant portion of your community not on board, it's going to be a lot harder. In a city of 1.5 million people, though, I think the business community is pretty small. What you're talking about is power, which, again, as someone who works with organizers, I think that's an incredibly important thing to keep in mind, right? The business community exists in the same place that the 1.5 million people of San Antonio exist. And I think there's also a fundamental question of like who actually empowers the business community, who works for the business community, who makes this city run, and it's not just the business community, it's far more people than that. Do you want to chime in? Yeah. No, I was getting ready for the next question. Oh, okay. <laughs> just, just so you all know, in my original seating chart, I had uh, Randy and Sophia at opposite ends. So. <laughs> um, anyway. I'm just wondering when you're going to take questions from the audience. 8.30. 8.30. I got a comment for all of it. Yeah, please, you'll be the first one. Um, I wanted to talk about, I wanted to talk about um, transparency in, um, in public subsidies. Um, I know as a journalist, um, we're always asking for uh, developers' financial documents so that we can see how much... Um, return they expect to get from their developments. And I know, Sophia, you've made this point uh, during Saha meetings, because Saha uh, does partner with developers. Um, and that, that incentive is, is different than the city's incentive. That, that's, those are public facility corporations which grant uh, the partnership, which includes the developer, a full property tax exemption. So not just the city, but a full property tax assumption. The Express News actually wrote a really good piece about that uh, recently. Um, but the point you've been that you've made a few times uh, during these uh, Saha meetings is that we need to know what um, we're getting in return for our subsidy, and whether that is balanced or not with what the developer is getting. And I wanted to see, and I guess my question is, should there be more transparency? Because as a journalist, where I'm coming from is, is I want to be able to explain and articulate how these um, incentive uh, agreements work. 
so that the public can decide whether they're whether they agree with the current version of CCHIP or not, whether they feel like the developer is getting too much incentive or maybe not enough incentive. And so I guess my, my question is, um, should, there be more, should there be more transparency um, in these types of incentive deals between public entities, specifically the city of San Antonio and developers? Um, and Mayor, do you want to um, go first? Or Lori, whoever. One of the benefits of the center city housing incentive policy is it is an as of right incentive policy. Sure. You know exactly what you're going to get. We put the executed agreements online. There isn't a secret to to those incentives. And we do get requests from time to time on the performance of those developments. We provide those um, once the contract is either executed or once the developer has authorized that release. But the C chip is as of right. There's no negotiation. You take it or you leave it. Now, anything above and beyond, we make sure that that is very transparent. We take it to a council committee. We take it to city council. We're not hiding anything. But that was one of the benefits of that as of right policy was to make sure that everyone knew exactly what everyone else was getting. There wasn't any gaming between right. the developers to try to get more. It's a level playing field. I, I guess my question was was, and you're right. The the city, I believe, um, when the when C chip was reinstated um, mm -hmm. in 2019, uh, your department put um, a database of all of the um, C chip projects, mm -hmm. and you can click on the. It shows you how much they're getting in public subsidy, and it, it links to the uh, the the mm -hmm. actual official agreement. Um, I, guess, I guess the point I was making is, is that missing from that equation is the return, the rate of return on investment that the, that the developer is getting and that if we're going to decide whether we agree with CCHIP and other forms of development, that we, that's a critical piece of information. And, and, and I will make the point because I know what developers will say is that when they put projects together financially, um, it, it's proprietary. And not every development is put together the same way, and they and that is a good point. I mean, these are these people run businesses, and they don't want to sh be sharing their secrets with you know their competition. But on the flip side, is <laughs> these are public resources; these are public subsidies, and so that's more of what I was well, getting at. That you know, the C chip has a two-year um, term. What we do during those two years is we monitor the market. We look to see, do these projects still need incentives? And that is the information that we provide to City Council when we make a recommendation on whether or not it's extended, terminated, or amended. And, but we do that, that, that research because it is public dollars. And we want to make sure that you know, we know that projects still need incentives. In the last rendition of the CCHIP, we learned that if you're a four-story stick-built building, outside of downtown, you're not having an affordable housing in it, you don't need an incentive. And we, we had the, the math to show that. And so that is no longer an option. We layered on a requirement for affordability or density, you do need an incentive. And we had the, the data to show that. And so we tweak our policy and make recommendations based on data. And that's why it's a two-year window, to give us enough time to really measure the market and come back with a recommendation. Gotcha. Uh, Mayor, should there be more transparency in these deals? Well, I certainly believe that um, when we're using public resources, we need to make sure that they're used consistently and that there is um, you know, predictability for the developers that are going to be using these incentives, which is why we came back with that criteria in the new C-CHIP. Um, you know, when I look at what are we getting for our dollar, I want to see the... Uh, the level of affordability, the density, and the certain AMI levels match what we are trying to incent with the with the C chip and the other incentive policies. To me, that's my measuring stick, and that's what we will be held accountable to. And if it's not matching up, then we change the program. Gotcha. So, do you? Absolutely. Um, yes, I want to. Uh, yes, we need transparency. I think it's a collaborative. It's a community-wide decision that gets made, right? And I appreciate that we elect council representatives to make these decisions for us, but part of a robust democracy is making sure that people are actually aware of what it is that they're getting in exchange 
for their tax dollars. I also am very concerned. I appreciate you being forthright and talking about the rate of return that you all earn on your projects, but I, I mean, it's, it's very e easy to beat up on bad developers, right? But I think I, I want to make sure that I that nobody is buying any one luxury car when there are people who are waiting in food lines who can't afford enough food to eat at the end of the month. And and if that's the truth, and and I we've just met, but I don't think you're lying to me. You know, I I just want to see that documented. I want us to know. I think that's something that absolutely is not an outrageous thing to put out in the public as a condition for getting incentives. And Randy, y'all haven't built housing yet, but you're gearing up to. That's right. And so what do you what do you think about? Should there be more transparency? Yeah, Lord, when you go to the website, can you see that? Can you see what Sophia's talking about? I can see. When you go to the website, you can look project by project and you can see the the, the type of housing, the price point for the housing, and um, we have the contract they've signed, we have the level of investment, we have all that information. But not the not the return. Is that was that is that your no? Point? The, the yeah. return is typically in the performa, and if we do receive that request, we typically um, ask the developer to provide that. Got it. Yeah. Look, I, I I don't know. I don't mean to disparage my peers, but there's just not a whole lot of confidential information in a pro forma. It's just math. Uh, so anyone claiming proprietary around math, I would really want to have that discussion. Okay. And I just think as a general policy, if you're asking for public monies, then the, I, I do believe the citizenry has a right to understand what's the return on that. I look forward to asking you that question when y'all start building. Yeah. <laughs> 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 well, what, well, at, well, I'll just ask you right now. You, you mentioned earlier the, that you agreed with the 68% return. Um, I know when I, when I interviewed Bill Schoen, who's with Silver Ventures, who, who built, who's building the Pearl, um, his point was that we can, his point was that they can uh, have a lower return because, and I think what he said was uh, below 5%. And, and he said, and the reason was because they're long-term holders of the Pearl. Like, they're building it to own it long, long-term. Um, they're not looking to build it and sell it right away like a lot of developers do. And so, what 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 is that return to be uh, for y'all as you build out uh, in West Downtown? You know, I wasn't there when you talked to Bill, so I won't. And you know, I have I admire him a great deal, but I would suggest there's another reason why they are unique. Okay. And you know, the 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 real reason, the, the person that's missing from this panel, uh, and I know you you study this a lot, is are really the banks. Okay. So, the the, the truth of the matter is. Without outside of the public subsidy realm, in the just we're going to go develop a piece of real estate realm, if you are not at that six to eight point range, the project's just not going to happen because nobody will loan you money to make it happen. We are not all silver ventures. Uh, that is another area in which they are unique. Is to my knowledge, they do not rely on lenders. They actually, uh, Bill Schoen told me that is that uh, the South Line residences, uh, which is their newest. Um, property, which is right on the other side of Newall. I think they said they got a HUD loan, um, they got a, a C-chip uh, package, and the rest is their own uh, equity. So, yeah. that, that may be one of the first times they've done that. Um, I want to, we're going to do uh, qu uh, audience questions uh, in about 10 minutes, but I, I did want to ask about neighborhoods. Um, I know as a journalist, I'm not supposed to like, give my opinion, but as, as someone who's grown up in the city and who went to Jeff and who lived with his grandmother on the west side for his high school years, I am a little bit concerned about the west side, uh, gentrifying. Um, obviously, uh, UTSA has ambitious plans to quadruple the size of their um, downtown campus. Um, you look at things like the San Pedro Creek Culture Park, um, the renovation of Alameda Theater. Um, none of, I don't think anybody would disagree. These are all great things. You know, we want these things to happen. Um, and obviously, you know, Randy, Western Urban, uh, like, like we were saying, 
you all have uh, quite a bit of land in the west downtown area and um, some of that is tied to the deal or the agreement that y'all made with the city and Frost. So y'all y'all gonna be de developing some properties there. I believe the municipal plaza building um, where city uh, council meets. I don't I, I, correct me if I'm wrong, but that's gonna stay put. But the upper floors will be turned into into housing. Um, and I guess I guess my question, and we'll just go down the road. I'll, I'll start with you, Randy. Um, are, when y'all have conversations about how you're going to develop West Downtown um, around where UTSA is right now and even closer on the other side of the highway, do, do y'all have conversations about this, about the impact that all this growth may have on uh, the West Side? We do, yes. Um, you know, and, and so the first time, uh, we never really intended to grow our development footprint um, in a westerly direction. We just, for, for years, um, that was not our strategy. Uh, our strategy has always been to strive for density and that our, our next project should be next to our last. <clears throat> and it wasn't until Dr. Amy at UTSA uh, convinced us that, that he was serious uh, about uh, a down camp, downtown campus expansion and improvement program that we thought that, uh, that we rethought that strategy. And so one of my first questions, not, not being, I'm, I didn't grow up in San Antonio, and I didn't know uh, where, where the West Side started. And so I've received a, 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 so a number of, of answers to that question when I asked folks that grew up here and specifically grew up on West Downtown or, or further west. And the answer that I most commonly get is San Pedro Creek. Gotcha. I don't, I don't know how that would resonate with with the group, but that's, I would just tell you, Andrew, that's the answer I most commonly receive. Some people say the interstate, but most of the time you get San Pedro Creek. So that frames, that really reframed how we, we own quite a bit of property along San Pedro Creek. Um, I don't, I don't think we're not at a point as a community. If we, if, if you look around the country where we're at risk of like a, um, like a one in one out type scenario, there's nobody living on these surface parking lots. Uh, it's not, no, we are, I don't think we have, at least um, amongst our holdings, we absolutely do not have a displacement risk. Right, right. Um, if yeah. that was your question. Well, I, I, I understand what you're saying, and you're absolutely correct. Um, when urban re renewal happened, it sort of wiped out the neighborhood right. that was there. And so, for many decades, there have been a lot of just lots and just a lot of unused <laughs> land. And so, but I guess... What I'm asking is, you know, as, as y'all build and as UTSA builds, I mean, UTSA is gonna is gonna build like a, a pedestrian bridge that actually connects the west side on the other side of Alazan Creek. Um, I mean, so downtown will connect with the west side, and y'all what y'all are gonna be doing may not directly affect the neighborhood directly, but y'all are pretty Very close. close, right? And so what I'm saying is that. As UTSA grows and so forth, are y'all cognizant of the fact that maybe not directly, maybe not in the, ne in the next five, ten years, maybe not, but maybe after that, what y'all do now mm -hmm. will impact the near the near west of it? Yeah, well, we hope it does. Yeah. We we hope it impacts it in a positive way. I mean, that's our um, that's our entire mission as a company is to be a part of building a city that all of our kids will call home. And so, absolutely. Okay. I, I may get back to you, but, but Sophia, do you want to? Thank you. Um, a few things. Um, where to begin? Uh, can you just restate your question sure. very succinctly? <laughs> um, do you think it's inevitable that the West Side will gentrify given all the different developments that we know are heading, headed that way? Uh, no, I don't. Okay. Um, I think a couple of things could happen. I think that I think that the West Side could completely change, right? I, I love this phrase, and I'm not trying to be mean to you, no. but I want a city that everybody's children can call home, right? Which includes the people who live there. Um, and and I appreciate you saying you too, and and I think that kind of improving the West Side 
really requires a conversation with people who currently live there now to figure out what improving actually means because it doesn't just mean that there are more dense houses. That's, that's not an improvement. I do think the other possibility that I envision is it actually stays the exact same, which I think is unlikely, but you, anything could happen. Literally anything could happen. Um, who knows? Perhaps coronavirus really is like the precipice of a recession, and, and we'll see what comes from that. But, um, but the other possibility I see is, and, and something that I think for the longest time I've meditated on, is the fact that we really should be able to improve people's quality of life without requiring a complete and total transformation. Like, it, it is unacceptable that there have been underperforming schools in that area for so long, and we've just accepted it. It's completely unacceptable that people's houses... I mean, I remember, I'm not from San Antonio either. I've lived here for five years. I'm originally from Austin. But I remember, and I think this is something I've had so many conversations with people about when I started to work on housing, um, is that just palpable sense that you get when you drive around certain parts of this city and you see houses that look like they're literally one or two bad storms away from falling over. And we've just accepted it. And that's wrong. That is completely wrong. So yeah. I, I hope that there's improvement, but it's a community conversation to figure out what that actually means. Yeah, and I, I think I stated my question a little bit too uh, plainly, I think. I mean, just I, get to say whatever we want when you do that. I know, I know. I mean, obviously we want the West Side to improve. I, it, it has not changed much since I was a baby, and I'm 41 years old. I mean, it, it's literally almost the same as it was when I was a kid. Yes, of course we want improvements. I guess what I'm talking about is... Um, how do we manage the change that is, to me, that is, is heading in that direction? I mentioned UTSA, Western Urban. I know VIA uh, is planning to, um, uh, they're planning to, 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 to do their first housing development, the old SCOBY um, complex. Um, and, uh, and obviously uh, the, the housing authority has plans to uh, demolish the Alazon courts and replace them with a, mix, with a mixed income community, just like they did with Wheatley Courts on the east side and uh, Victoria Courts uh, downtown. So just want to clarify, I'm, I'm not saying don't touch the west side. But Mayor, do you want to? Uh, yeah, sure. I think that uh, we have to acknowledge that San Antonio's uh, unique cultural and historic heritage is part of our competitive advantage. It's one of the people, reason why people want to move here they visit here, it's because San Antonio is a, a, a city that's unique. Um, and it also has uh, qualities that uh, have been enjoyed by generations after generations. So we also have to acknowledge that things are going to change. I mean, the city is one of the fastest growing in the country. And unless we want it to continue to sprawl unsustainably into the suburbs, which costs us all and contributes to the kind of um, suburban poverty that we're, we're beginning to see, then we're going to have to acknowledge that density is part of the solution. So how do you do that but also preserve your cultural heritage? It's something that I, I would like to say, I agree with Sophia, as somebody who, who grew up in, in Austin with the high school there, Austin did not figure out until it was too late. We have the opportunity to change that destiny, and I think it's incumbent upon us to do that because we do derive so much of our uh, competitive advantage from it. Um, the last two terms uh, for the city council, I've had a committee established that ties the planning process, community development, land planning, uh, neighborhood services, to cultural preservation, how we balance those two things. I don't think there's an easy answer. Um, but I do think it requires us to be thoughtful about how we look at investment. Um, it's not okay for things to remain the same. If things remain the same, then the impacts of redlining from 70 years ago would continue to persist. We would have even worsening poverty in, uh, in the west side as well as the east side um, and, and, and lots of areas in between. We are deliberately taking more resources and pouring them into infrastructure investments on the east and the west side because they've been left behind so long and we're doing that in the name of equity. And when we do that, it raises property values and that people who are susceptible to rising taxes who are 
uh, likely on fixed incomes are more, more likely to feel the burdens of displacement. So what we've done in the housing policy work is acknowledge that we can't change that dynamic overnight, but we can at least have some safety nets in place, things like a risk mitigation policy and a fund so that there's a resource that people can tap into so that um, folks that are on, on the bubble and would be on the verge of displacement if taxes went up because property values are increasing, uh, we can assist them and allow them to stay. I wholeheartedly agree with Sophia. Um, it's not okay to drive by housing that is on the verge of uh, being unsafe and say in the name of cultural preservation we're not going to touch it. That's not what we're saying. What we're saying is we want to be able to preserve that housing, preserve the people that are in that housing, so that they're not displaced when we actually improve that housing. And so we're also, as part of the Housing Policy Task Force work, putting a lot more funding, most of it federal funding by the way, into owner-occupied rehabilitation. We have innovative new programs like um, you know, under one roof that will fix roofing. We've got programs that, that basically allow a family likely there for generations, likely on fixed income, likely on the verge of displacement if it was just about improvement of a property value and the tax rate increase, who would be displaced if we didn't have those measures in place. Not everybody's going to be touched. There is going to be displacement. Our policy is that any displacement, for that reason, is unacceptable. We will pursue that till we get it to nothing. But in the meantime, we've got to have programs in place to catch people so that we don't just simply accept that things have to remain the same. Um, and cultural preservation is, is part of the reason, part of the thing that we're trying to protect in the process. Okay. Uh, Lori, you want to answer the question, but also um, this will be the last response and then we'll start going around the room for questions. Um, if you want to answer the question, but also if, if you can give us an update on the affordable housing uh, plan, because it is underway and I, I haven't heard an update lately, but um, how, how are things going in terms of like housing production and, and that, those types of things at different AMI levels, etc.? Okay. I'm going to go to your first question, and you asked Randy if you know they think about what's happening to the West Side as they work on their projects. and. I want to answer that from the city's perspective, and we absolutely do. And I'll mention the Alameda Theater. We talk about redeveloping the theater. We just recently um, have TPR moving in to the backstage of that area. Um, the Alameda Theater will start construction next month. But every time that board gets together, we talk about making sure that it is a place for the community and that people can afford to go to the theater, people are not priced out of the theater, and that it is a place for the community. The same with Market Square. We've just gone through a major um, visioning process for Market Square, and what people love about Market Square is you can stroll through Market Square and you can see families from all income levels. There's something there for everyone. We wanna make sure that we keep that authentic and we keep, keep that thing that people love about Market Square there. Um, San Pedro Creek. Same thing, it's a place for the people. So all the projects that we work on, we do think about the community and making sure that it's accessible to everyone. Um, the budget, the affordable housing budget, increased by about $9 million this year. The mayor alluded to a lot of programs that it funded this fiscal year, talked about the risk mitigation fund, talked about our owner-occupied rehab and our infill pilot program. Um, I think it is horrible that children who are walking to school pass by vacant lots and vacant buildings. And we do have funding in our budget to help purchase lots and partner with an affordable housing provider to build a home on that. But a lot of the discussion this budget year was about preserving home ownership and making sure people can stay in their home. And so we're exploring programs through a grant that we received um, called For Every Home, For Every One Home. Grand, I think that's the name of it, but it talks about community land trust. How can we create land trust to help people whose income is limited, but their taxes continue to go up? How can we make sure they can they can continue to live in that home? The same with a neighborhood empowerment zone program. So we have a lot of tools that we're looking at to help preserve people um, people's ability to stay in their home. Um, our affordable housing plan. I mean, this fiscal year alone. And we just awarded over the past month 
about ten and a half million dollars to nine projects that will produce about 600 affordable housing units. And that was money that was provided to the city um, staff through the affordable housing budget that was adopted in this fiscal year. We also have about 1,400 projects separate, 1,400 housing units separate from that 600 um, unit number that we've helped facilitate through the 4% tax credit program. And so the state of Texas um, administers the 9% competitive tax credit program and the 4% non-competitive tax credit program. That, require, that provides a tax credit to a developer provided that their units on average are at the 60% area median income or below. And what we learned through last year's um, budget was we had goals for 60% AMI and below. We saw a lot of housing units that were between 50 and 60% AMI because that tax credit rewarded for having, that was the threshold, just make it below 60. No one was going deeper than that. Now through income averaging, which was a state law um, change, or a change that was recently made, you can have some units that are above 60% and you can have some that go deeper to maybe 30, 40, or 50 provided everything averages at 60%. So that was a big change um, that's really helped facilitate that deeper affordability. So just this fiscal year alone, 1,400 units that if they pursue, proceed with the 4% tax credit deal, they will come to fruition in another about 600 that the city's been able to subsidize through our federal funding. So we are making a big dent. What we're currently doing now is looking at how we can recalibrate our goals. The Mayor's Housing Task Force framework, was it's a great framework, and it has goals for ownership, renter, and it breaks it down by AMI. We learned a lot the first year, and so we really need to treat this as a living document, so we're working with the Housing Commission and recalibrating those goals to see, do we need to have more 30% units and less of that 60 to 80% unit? And the answer is yes. And we learned that we were able to get a lot done just through the, the tax credit alone. And we need to really focus our funding on helping that 50% AMI family or below. And so we're going to be recalibrating those goals. Um, something that I, I want to mention, I see Jessica Guerrero here, who is our incoming Housing Commission Chair. Uh, we recently went through an exercise with Jessica's leadership to look at our risk mitigation fund. And... She brought the community to to that exercise. The risk brought, mitigation fund is the, is the eviction Yes, it was a million dollars put aside to help people with eviction. City staff created that, looking at best practices, but it was time to amend it, and Jessica brought a committee together of people who've actually lived through eviction issues. And they came up with several recommendations um, that we're going to be implementing as a result of that work. And... It just speaks to the importance of including the community in those discussions and having the community look at those policies. Not the practitioners. We can look at best practices, but I want to commend her for that work because that was probably one of those powerful discussions and presentations I've seen because it came from them. Gotcha. Okay. We're going to do uh, um, audience questions here, and I have a cord, so you may have to come up a little bit. Let's go right here. Um, okay, um, just a few. Okay, just a few points. Um, you asked how much does your paycheck go to rent? A hundred percent. A hundred percent of my paycheck goes to rent. Every now and then, I don't know how I do it, but I pay my CPS bill. Go figure. Two or three times I've already experienced almost being homeless again. These apartments are way too expensive. Somebody says market rate. Market rate housing is what kept me homeless longer than what I needed to be. We need more affordable, like real affordable housing. Not this stuff that you were explaining, Ron. Um, I'm talking real affordable, like five, or $600 a month, not $1,300 a month for a small studio. You're talking about funding public transportation. That's a big one now. I heard about that. I'm researching it, Ron. 
If we fund public transportation, Victoria knows. I blew up her phone texting her. She showed you the stories. If you fund public transportation, that means you're going to own Via. Is that correct? Because if you do, is the abuse to all the people that are living in homelessness going to stop? Is the security, the police officers, going to stop abusing homeless people? And are you going to turn the shelters that you now have, are you going to turn them into the very badly needed day shelters for homeless people? That would be an excellent idea. I'll be right behind that idea if we actually say yes to that. Um, One question at a time. Yeah. <laughs> Darn. We have a lot of people. Okay, okay, okay. The west one side. More, more. Last point. West side. I love the west side. Don't touch the west side. I'm born and raised in San Antonio. You only have one point of charm left in this city, and that is in the west side. You're already kind of starting to ruin it in some places of the city. Don't ruin the charm. Don't ruin. You're going to lose the charm if you touch the west side any more than what you have. Thank you. Um, Ma'am, did you? Yeah. Thank you. I don't really have a question per se. My name is Erica Heisel, and my first career was in housing counseling. I was actually a housing counselor to help people in their first time home or keep themselves out of foreclosure. I moved here to Texas for that. So I helped 22 nonprofits in a variety of different states. And I just, I think that I'm apologize. I appreciate you putting this panel together, I don't find this very diverse. I find it to be three bureaucrats and the private industry. And as the developer mentioned, there are lots of people missing here. I have been a landlord since 2005, and I will be starting the Landlord Network to put together that this is not just one-sided. You know, it's great to have people not sleeping on the street. I'd like to ask the city how much you're paying Haven for Hope every year to make sure the people are housed. And I think that the churches, my church included, has been involved with maybe doing a little bit more direct help with people that need housing. Not the non not the developers, per se, but something a little akin to the San Antonio Housing Authority, where you help them catch up with rent. I briefly worked at San Ministries, the first and last uh, community development person there. So I just kind of want to challenge you all for that. And um, a developer that maybe would have developed affordable housing would have been helpful as well. And so I just want to um, ask the panelists, whichever one wants to respond, what do you say of that? What is your opinion of the private industry helping a little bit better directly to consumers? <coughs> It might be a little bit too big. Maybe you could translate. <laughs> it might be too big for me too. Yeah, okay. It might be too big for me too. Oh, you want to just ask concisely. So we, it's kind of like demonizing the private industry. So maybe in a in a more positive way, how could the private industry be more helpful other than developing new affordable housing units, which to be honest, seeing on my church end, doesn't really help the direct consumer. Is that too big still? It might, it might be. <laughs> <laughs> so beyond the affordable housing units, do you have plans to put funding or additional funding or revise your programs that help directly on the street or facing eviction is I think what you have seen. Thank you. I, I guess I interpreted that question slightly differently, but if the question is, are we putting funding in place to help folks that are on the verge of eviction, the, the answer is absolutely 100% yes. And that's what you were hearing Lori describe with the risk mitigation policy, the risk mitigation fund, the work that we're doing for preservation of homes, existing homes, by keeping people in their homes. Uh, generally, on the issue of private sector, all of the things that we're talking about up here 99% of it is being done by the private sector. What we're trying to do is create a policy ecosystem and in some smaller cases, programs and funding that helps facilitate a market that the private sector is building affordable housing that people can live in and can afford. I 
And then we need more, more questions. Um, This one? Uh, any other questions? Yeah. Hello. So, my question is. Thank you. My question is as a community, as people from San Antonio, what can we do to help, you know, anything as far as helping the low income? Um, housing, how, what can we do? Is there something in particular we need to help you as a, as a community to get these programs to help other, you know, the communities that are low income and all that? Because it's really hard, it's, being on a board, it's very easy to point fingers and say, you all are not doing enough, but how can we help you? As a community, I'd like to know, is there something I should get involved in? Is there something we can get involved in to help you? Is there, you know, maybe we need to get form, um, the word just left me. <laughs> um, so basically it's that. What can we do? Is there something coming up that we need to vote on? Is there something that we can do to help you all get what, you know, what you're trying to accomplish? How can we, what can we do to help you? I have two concrete thoughts about that. I mean, I think they're concrete. You might not think they're, they're not maybe things you could do literally tomorrow. Well, maybe you could. Talk to your neighbors. You know, one of the things that I personally find very frustrating is when I hear or read about, um, so I, I have a lot of issues with the tax credit program, and I would love to talk to anybody who wants to listen to them about those issues. They're very specific, but I acknowledge that it is the best tool that we have, unfortunately, to build affordable housing in this country, um, but I, I feel like on a regular basis, I read about neighborhoods that don't want poor people in them. It's such a big issue, and, and I was zoning commissioner for a while in District 1, and I feel like there were so many times when I would sit in people's living rooms and I would hear these conversations about how people don't want to have renters in their community, they only want homeowners. I'm a renter. There are tons of people who are renters. Not all renters look like me, right? It's just a ridiculous thing to say. And so I think just having conversations with all of the people that you know, I think this is something that all of us should do. We need to destigmatize poverty. People are not poor because they're bad people. People are not homeless because they are bad people. Shit happens. That's, that's as simple as you can say it. And I think spending time talking to people about that and making sure that we all understand that it is not a moral failing, in my mind, is the number one thing that we should all be doing. And I think by virtue of doing that, it helps build support. Again, big believer in organizing. It helps build support to really form the, the programs and I think the ideas that are actually going to help create transformative change. We have time for one more question. Um. Thank you. Okay. So I know that the regional planning effort is designed to align with other planning efforts, such as SA Connect, to make sure that as we face a great few decades of change and the opportunity to make prevent the crisis from getting worse in, with housing in particular, there's a desire to align plans. Um, my specific question is whether you're also looking at uh, utilities as part of your alignment of plans. I haven't really heard a lot about a utilities committee, and I know um, with shifting the sales tax from aquifer protection, which provides 70% of our water, to funding transportation, which is also really important, if there were to be an environmental incident or an issue with water, I mean, right now, because of the affordable, the way rates are set up with SAWS, I know a lot of small duplex multifamily landlords have to be bracketed with a higher business level of, you know, utilities, and that translates to higher rents. Um, so are we looking at that in terms of trying to align plans to see how some of the policies that are in place or that we desire to be in place may also cause unintended consequences and try and mitigate as much as possible? Yes, absolutely, 100% yes. And I didn't think there was any question that could be asked that would be more important than us leading on what Sophia just said, uh, which I think is extremely important. The, the great intent of inclusive housing dies in the Zoning Commission quite often. And we need to not let that happen. If there is an important charge for the public to be involved in, it's to make sure that good intentions don't go to die in places like zoning and planning and city council decisions. Um, but on your question about utilities, absolutely. Um, 
from uh, SAWS. SAWS right now, San Antonio Water System is undergoing a rate uh, advisory committee process where they're restructuring the rates. One of the uh, primary issues in that is, to, is the question of affordability and making sure that there is a lifeline of water rates that re remains affordable for even the most uh, income disadvantaged members of the community. In addition to that, building the rates so that we're, we're prioritizing conservation, uh, and environmental sustainability. A parallel effort is about to take place, has never taken place before to my knowledge, that I've asked the CPS utility to undergo so that we protect affordability but that we're also doing so while we're trying to in incent things like renewable energy um, and you know ensuring that we're, we're um, doing our part on climate action and, and, and adaptation. Um, but I do want to say something about the aquifer and water. And I can say this because I've spent most of my time as a public servant dealing with this issue. Uh, we, have, we have determined a path that will not require a rate increase on anyone, that will also not require any raise in taxes, that will allow us to finally invest in public transportation, but that also ensures a continuous stream uh, and continuity for the Edwards Aquifer Protection Program. It is true that from here until infinity, that the cheapest, most abundant, and what guarantees us affordability for our water supply is the Edwards Aquifer Protect, is the Edwards Aquifer. We have to ensure that we protect that source. One part of that is the Edwards Aquifer Protection Program, which buys conservation easements with your sales tax over areas in the Uvalde and Medina that ultimately recharge into our water supply. Um, I'm sorry I'm going into the weeds about this, but it's important. We are simply saying that we should continue to buy conservation easements in the Uvalde and Medina and even potentially in the Comal, but do so with capital dollars that are financed over time rather than using the precious few dollars that we have that are the only legislative authorized operational dollars for public transit and finally build transit. So we can have both. We just have to do so with collective action, and that's what we propose. I am going to have to... Uh, okay. Yeah, we, we can just wrap it up now. Okay. Um, th thank you all for doing this, Randy, Sophia, Mayor Nuremberg, uh, Lori. And thank you all for showing up. Thank you for the